begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious God, on this uh, glorious day, we begin our Lenten journey. And so we ask that you be with us as we seek how we live as Christians, how you call us to follow in the way of Jesus. So be with us in, in our study, our discussion, and in our serving, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I've got a couple handouts to start with. So let me start with this one and just send it on around. Um, and this is the class schedule. So we'll be covering a different mark of discipleship every week. Today we're going to do reading the Bible. Um, and so we'll do that here in the Sunday school class. Um, and then I will also pick up on it uh, during the uh, worship service in my sermon. Um, we will take a break Easter Sunday and just enjoy ourselves and have breakfast together. And then the Sunday after Easter, we'll be doing um, kind of a, a wrap up and overview. So this is actually an adaptation of a course I taught for um, uh, a program called Diakonia. It's a two year training program for folks who are interested in being what we call a parish deacon in a, in a local congregation. So Ed Borman and Steve Beaver, who are our congregational deacons, this is part of the coursework that they did. So it's a two year program. And um, so I was, I was uh, I've done a number of the different courses, and the one that they gave me back in 2017 was Daily Life of the Christian. So I did the Marks of Discipleship using a book that's there on uh, the first page called Real Faith for Real Life by Mike Foss. Mike Foss is a friend of mine who is now a retired pastor, served um, uh, a large congregation up in Minnesota for a number of years, um, and while he was there, came up with um, a way to teach the marks of discipleship that uh, both was creative and a little more accessible. These practices that we do as Christians have been used uh, for the life of the church, but how you make them memorable and accessible um, and open for conversation, uh, uh, he did a nice job with this particular book. So you can get it uh, on Amazon. Uh, I think the Kindle version, if, if you do Kindle like I do, is about eight bucks. The paperback is uh, about 14. If you get it new, you might. There, it's also available to use in some places. So, we'll. I'll be referencing that book at times during this. I highly recommend it. It's, it's an easy read. Um, and it kind of walks through all these, uh, but it's not necessary uh, to do this. It's just a, a really good resource. Um, the other thing, we're going to be reading the Bible. So we'll be looking at all four Gospels. Um, I'll be referencing Luther's small catechism. And then some of the other things here, Bible Gateway is an online Bible resource. I'm going to say more in just a little bit because today we're talking about the Bible. But I'm also going to be using some videos from a series called NUMA. It came out in early 2000. Um, and each week we're going to look at a different video. That's listed on the back. Um, we're going to watch one of these videos. They're usually about 10, 12 minutes. Um, that ties in with the particular theme that we're wrestling with. Today, it's going to be reading the Bible. So um, that's kind of the roadmap of where we're going to go. Um, as I've said before, anytime we have a, a class like this, the only, the only stupid question is the one you never ask, and Bible's always a fun one because um, I have found over the years most folks want to do Bible study, but they're nervous about doing Bible study because they don't think they know enough about the Bible, and so therefore they don't start to study the Bible to know more about the Bible because they don't know enough about the Bible and you see the loop that you get stuck in. So. Um, we're going to talk about some easy ways in which you can not only ease that in, but how you can coach other people uh, to get into reading the Bible and not be scared. So let's see. Uh, I think, judging from the time, I'm going to s start with a uh, video clip. How many of you have ever seen the TV show Modern Family? A few of you have. Okay. Yeah. This is a cute video that was done by um, a church in Dallas that's a little bit, it's a play on Modern Family, but it's about 
dealing with the issue of reading the Bible. Ha! I gotcha! You can run, but you can't hide, guys. Besides, I knew you'd have breakfast. Excuse me, honey, you're standing in front of the toaster. Sorry, sorry. So here we all are, together as a happy family. Dad, could you get the orange juice? Yes, sweet. Good old vitamin C. It's good for the immune system. Seriously, guys, I want to give the old family a shot of vitamin B today. Vitamin B? Yeah, vitamin B, Timmy. As in the Bible, it's an essential part of this complete breakfast. Dad, why are you so weird? I know, right? Shouldn't you be at work checking Facebook? Or at work checking Facebook? Facebook, Timmy? How about Facebook? Seriously, guys. I think it's important for us to all start gathering around this faith book on a regular basis. And what better time to do that than around the breakfast table? Let us taste and see that the Lord is good. Besides, man cannot live by English muffins alone. <laughs> so we've been talking a lot about it at church lately, the integration of church life and home life. And it's been convicting, i got to tell you. Yeah, I can't even remember the last time that we all read the Bible together. Well, that's because we've never actually done that. I mean, I think the last time I remember reading the Bible was when I was in labor with our first child. And that was strictly for your benefit, not mine. I still passed out. It was pretty embarrassing. So what do you guys say? Can we do this as a family, as a team? Dad, I have to clear for this exam. I totally didn't study enough lessons. Well, maybe you should have thought of that last night, little lady, before you went to the movies with Reggie. His name is Teddy. And besides, that movie was an acquired homework assignment. Oh, I wish I could have gone to the movies for homework when I was younger on dates as well. I wish you could have gone to the period when you were younger. Okay, Dad. I think you're right. You do? Yeah. Let's do it. Let's all read the Bible together. <laughs> Honey, are you feeling all right? <laughs> <laughs> It's called reverse psychology. My social studies teacher taught us all about it, and I thought I'd give it a try. <laughs> Look, that sure backfired. Silly Maria. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's not just going to start talking to us. I think you have to open it and read it. I know, Jill, but I don't exactly know where to begin. I don't know. Just open it, close your eyes, point, and God or somebody will tell you what to read. <laughs> sure. Why don't we try that? Well, it says your navel is a rounded goblet that never lacks blended wine. Uh, your waist is a mound of lean encircled by lilies. Your breasts are like... Okay, okay. <laughs> 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 Dad, what does it say? I just never knew the Bible could be so exciting. Don't get too excited. <laughs> 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 That is from Song of Songs, <laughs> which is uh, to really one of the most, it, it, it's, it's a quite fascinating book of the Bible because it is an erotic love poem between a, a young man and a young woman, and it's attributed to Solomon, but it got included in the Old Testament, and the church fathers in the early centuries of the church really struggled with it and tried to come up with profound reasons why it's there. The most common way of approaching it was, well, this is describing the relationship between God and the church, in which case God is a hunk and uh, the church is steaming hot, you know, so... <laughs> Yeah, so 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 be careful. There, there's a, there's a, a a joke that's gone around with pastors for years about the guy who who was just at the end of his rope and thought he just needs to end his life. It's just not worth doing, and so he's sitting in a hotel room. He says, "Well, maybe God will tell me what I should do, and will stop me." So he opens up the Bible and points and does the same thing. Points to a verse and said, "And then Judas went out and hung himself." He said, God didn't mean that. God didn't mean that. So he opens it back up again. Points down. Go thou and do likewise. <laughs> but you know, we, we kind of treat the Bible as, as almost a magic answer book. Um, or how many of you remember the magic eight balls? 
I had those as kids. You shake, I, I still have one up in my office somewhere. You, know, you shake it, you ask it a question. And we, we kind of treat the Bible that way. Um, that it's, it's, it's somehow there to answer everything we need and it's got, there's a verse for everything type of stuff. But what really is the Bible? What would you, uh, how, how would you describe the Bible to someone who asked you, what is it? We mentioned history. History. Inspired visions and experiences. Inspired visions. Inspired experiences of people encountering God. What else? It's a document that uh, all Christians have in common. Mm -hmm. So we can go and study the Word of God. We all That's use it. the same Old Testament and New Testament. <laughs> Unless you have the wrong interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're staying at a Marriott, you're, <laughs> you're in for a surprise. <laughs> then you'll see a book of Mormon alongside you. That's a whole other story. So, so yeah. Um, the Bible is, you know, like, like Bill said, it is um, common to all Christians. It's the one thing we, we all... Uh, agree on. It's um, the foundation of our faith. We call it the Word of God. We use words like inspired to describe what's in here. And, and yet, we acknowledge it's written by human beings. It has histories, though the histories are not written the way we write history today. Um, the histories are, are highly personalized, but they do the histories recount real events. It also includes parables, stories that were that are not intended to be taken factually, but are are there for the purpose of teaching. Jesus' parables are a great example of that. Um, the Book of Jonah is another example. You have poetry, like a Song of Songs and Psalms. Uh, you have wise sayings and proverbs. You have letters. In the back of the Bible, in the New Testament, you've got Paul's letters that he literally wrote to Christian churches who were having difficulties. So they wrote him a letter with questions, and he wrote back with his answers. Um, and so all these things are grouped together in a book that roughly, if you take the earliest portions of it to when it was wrapped up, was written over about 2,000 years really long time. So it is um, perhaps the one, of the, it is one of the oldest books. It is the best-selling book ever in history, um, most widely circulated, and um, for, for people it is rather scary. Now today, um, the first Sunday of Lent always begins with the story of Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. And it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, first three Gospels. And one thing to keep in mind about the Bible, what are the four Gospels? Okay, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a lot in common. Uh, many of the things that they, that, that they record and talk about are shared among all three. So the temptation of the wilderness is there. Um, some of the description, descriptions of the Last Supper, that, that's all in there. Um, Matthew and Luke have the Sermon on the Mount, but some details are different because Luke's version is on a flat plain, and whereas Matthew's is said to be on a mountaintop. John, on the other hand, is on planet Mars. He is just, <laughs> he is somewhere else doing something entirely different. So uh, most of the stories that are in Matthew, Mark, and Luke never appear in John. John is doing his own thing. Um, so there's no temptation of the wilderness in, in John's gospel, but the other three all contain that. And the temptation happens right after Jesus is baptized. Holy Spirit drives Jesus out into the wilderness and then he is 
tempted by the devil. So let me go ahead and, and read this for you. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during all those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down for here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from Jesus until an opportune time. What jumps out at you about that story? The best way to, to convince somebody to do something is to get where they are and then use it to you. Jesus has an answer for every challenge. Where's the answer come from? Yeah. So he's, Jesus is quoting the Old Testament. So with the first two temptations, the devil throws us out there, and Jesus counters with that. The third temptation, the devil quotes the Bible. And Jesus quotes the Bible right back. How does it make you feel that the devil knows, knows the Bible? been around long enough. The Bible can be misused as a weapon. It can be misquoted. It can be, as one of my, one of my college professors said, you work hard enough, you can create a recipe for brownies out of the Bible if you really want to make it happen. Um, What Jesus is doing, though, is something different than what is commonly referred to as proof texting. Proof texting is um, taking a Bible verse to kind of uh, justify and back up any argument you have. There's appropriate times to do that. There's other times where you can just simply proof text, and it's, well, the Bible said it, and that settles it, and I'm not going to talk anymore. Um, Jesus isn't using these as magic answers to drive the devil away. As we, as we dig into the story later on in the service, Jesus is coming to understand who he is as the Son of God in, in this. The 40 days in, in the wilderness uh, has significance. That's one of the things when you study the Bible, there are things that are said in there that you need to take the time to learn because we don't talk that way, and we don't have the customs of, say, 2,000 years ago. So for example, let's have fun with the 40. Does the number 40 have any significance? Where have you heard the number 40 mentioned before? 40 years exile in the wilderness, yeah? Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the whale, 40 days. Noah was on the ark, 40 days. Something of a pattern. Fasting. Fast, yep. So he's fasted for 40 days. So what does that mean, 40? 40 years in the Bible is a generation. The number 40 sometimes can mean the number between 39 and 41. Sometimes it means it's shorthand for a long time. Uh, so there are different things in the Bible where 
40 is going to ha have significance. Number 12 has significance. The number 7 has significance. So Jesus does a miracle feeding the crowds, um, uh, feeding the 5,000. And there are 12 leftover baskets of bread that are all collected by his right-hand guys, of which there are how many? And the tribes of Israel had how many? When one studies the Bible, one needs to take the time to not just simply read the words, but be able to understand what's all being said. It's a little bit like reading the King James Version of the Bible. Folks have asked me, in fact, let me send this around right now, I'm thinking of it. This is a little study guide that I put together a couple of years ago on how to read the Bible and just kind of a brief overview of translations and resources and those type of things. Um, so, for example, if you're going to get into the Bible, you need to understand the content. Um, and you also need to have some tools because it's just, it, it's, a, it's on the other side of the world, it's a completely different culture. So for example, the King James translation of the Bible, how many of you have heard of King James? King James. Not written by King James. Uh, King James uh, of England authorized the first widely used English translation of the Bible. He <coughs> commissioned to have that happen. And yeah, 1620s is, is when the project uh, was finally completed. Time of Shakespeare. How many of you like Shakespeare? I do. I love, I love Romeo and Juliet. How many of you, if you pull out Shakespeare and start reading it, understand it? <laughs> I admit, when I, when I watch Shakespeare on, on TV, I turn on the closed caption. Um, to understand a Shakespearean play in Shakespearean English requires a minimum of a 12th grade reading comprehension level. It's a different style of English. There's different sayings and idioms and other things that we just don't get. So when you throw the Bible together with King James English, going to take some work, which is why the different translations have come about over the years uh, to help us better understand the Bible in the languages we speak in our day and time. Martin Luther um, is the one responsible for that whole movement, because prior to Luther it was in Latin, and if you translated anything else, you got killed and burned at the stake. Or burned at the stake, and then you die. But... Uh, um, so now there are a whole variety of different translations that are available out there to better help you understand. We talked about some of those a couple of weeks ago. Uh, in fact, in here, if you turn to page four, I've got a couple of recommendations there. So before you really can get into reading the Bible, you need to get a Bible. Um, so eventually you can get to the point, like Jesus and the devil, where you can actually quote it and remember parts. Um, the Lutheran Study Bible is the first one that I have there as far as the print Bibles. It's also available electronically. But uh, this is my copy. Um, it says NRSV, New Revised Standard. Um, and this is what we use in our bulletins. This is what's in our pews, those green ones we looked at a few weeks ago. The nice thing about the Lutheran Study Bible and I always recommend folks, if they want to get a Bible, always get a study Bible, because it's got all the handy notes, and it has paragraph headings. It helps you follow what's going on. If you just get nothing but the print, like the ones we have in the pews, guarantee you're going to get lost. You might get through Genesis, probably Exodus, and then when you hit Leviticus, you're done. And if you, if you really plow through, numbers will do you in, because there's nothing more fun than reading a census in the Bible. Um, so having the study notes that can explain some of the phrases, some of the places, and so forth, you know, having maps in the back, 
Uh, this is a good, solid Bible. There's a couple different varieties. There's a paperback that's about 20. If you get a leather-bound one like this, it's about $40. Um, but Lutheran Study Bible, Augsburg, Aug, Augsburg Fortress Publishing is the publisher. The reason I say that is on the next page, on page five, I mention another Lutheran Study Bible by Concordia Publishing. I don't recommend that one. Um, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod has its own publishing house. We in the ELCA have our publishing house. Um, so the Concordia Study Bible is done from the perspective of Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. So if, unlike us, where we, we ordain women, they don't. And their study notes will tell you why you shouldn't and why women should keep their mouths shut um, in church and defer to their husbands in all things which honestly all men every now and then uh, dream about, but then uh, instantly regret having that, that dream. Um, so it's, it's done from, every study Bible has its own perspectives. And, and uh, the, the, the really nice thing about the Lutheran Study Bible by Concordia is it has a lot of Luther quotes and resources from Martin Luther. On the other hand, some of the study notes are not in the place where we are as far as the ELCA. And so it's, 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 it's much more conservative, even. It's still in the 1800s on, on some of the stuff. So I have a copy. There's, if I want to look for Luther quotes attached to the Bible, I'll probably pull that out because it's a good resource. Um, some of it's done really well, some of it not so much. So that's many, my two cents. Many of these are available online. You can load them on your phone yeah. and have the app available. So most any print version, as Bill said, you can get that way um, with the study notes and everything else. Um, there's also my favorite Bible app is called Bible Gateway, and I've got the link there. Um, it's sponsored by Zondervan. It's got several hundred um, Bible translations that are on there, probably 50 some that are in English, uh, and then a whole slew of you know, pretty much any language. I think there's eight different Chinese variations that you could. So it's kind of fun just to kind of, you can do them side by side on the screen and do comparisons. And, uh, so that's, that's handy. Um, Logos Bible software originally started out as a very heavy duty uh, Bible program for folks who are seminarians or uh, college professors who really were into Greek and Hebrew. Um, it was a very difficult program to use unless you were really into the Bible text uh, and you knew the original languages. They have since in the last 10 years absorbed three other companies that did basic Bible apps. And so it now is, is a very accessible um, base, they got a couple different base versions. So that's, that's a good one to take a look at. Unlike Bible Gateway, which is free, Logos you have to pay for. It. But um, it, it also provides you with more tools. So. And, and like, a, like our school, with because uh, in our school is religious, it goes up. What our school that they, they, that we use Bible Gateway. That's what that's what the school recommend for us to use, especially with um, we have a, a religious class. I'm going to be taking at some point, and that's the one thing that they recommend at the university. The Bible Gateway is both a web page and it comes in, in apps, um, which which is handy. Let's see. What's Let me pause for a minute and ask, what questions do you have right now? What questions have you had about the Bible that have either gotten the way of you studying the Bible or has bothered you or you just have always wanted to ask? Martha. If the Israelites are the chosen people, 
What does that make us? Chosen as well. <laughs> and, and the place to read that about that is actually in the book of Romans, um, where the church in Rome asked that very question. If the church is now the new Israel, if we're now the new chosen people, what does that mean for the people of Israel? Um, are they now left out of the cold? Has God turned his back on the people of Israel who haven't accepted Jesus? Luther wrestled with that question. Paul makes it very clear in the book of Romans, when God makes a promise, God keeps it. And if you read the whole of the Old Testament, no matter how many times the people of Israel rebelled against God, God never gave up on Israel. Well, they got punished. They got exiled. They had to be responsible for the consequences of their actions. But Paul makes it clear in Romans that God has not given up on the people of, of Israel, and they remain his chosen people because God is gracious and merciful, and the covenant that God made with Abraham was unconditional. God will accomplish these things. And that's one of the things when you get into the Bible, there are certain things when you start reading the Bible, you have to start at the beginning, there are certain things that are themes that are carried out from the beginning to the end. So it's no accident that Genesis starts with the creation of the world, human beings in the Garden of Eden, and then the fall, and then the explanation of why the world is the way it is now. And then the last book of the Bible ends with, you now you have apocalypse, but it doesn't quite happen. The world ends and the world is recreated in an instant. And then God re recreates the world the way God intended, and chapter 21 is a remarkable image. Because we have a tendency to think, oh, you know, when we die, we're going to go to heaven. No, that's not what Revelation says. Revelation says when everything is set right, God comes and lives among his people here. Which is a remarkable vision. That the world is, is, is set right the way God intended from the beginning. So that's why you have the bookends. That uh, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven and God announces that he will now dwell with his people and there will be no more tears and no more sadness. It's a beautiful image. But to get from point A to point B, we have to go through the whole story. And one thing that is key out of Genesis is the story of Abraham. God makes a covenant with a guy named Abraham within known history, somewhere around... Eh, 18, 1900 BC. Um, and God makes a covenant. It's a one side covenant. God says that He will bless Abraham with many descendants, He will give him a promised land, and that His descendants will be a blessing to all the nations of the world. And God says He will accomplish this. Abraham doesn't have to do anything. And so Abraham leaves his home, he, and he never inherits the promised land. It's a fascinating story. He ends up being buried there, but he has to buy a cemetery to be buried in. But those promises to Abraham carry on throughout the entire Bible, and they're key to understanding who Jesus is. So reading through the Bible is important because it's... It's not just a random collection of, of library books. There, there is an underlying theme throughout it all, which is where a study Bible like this can be really helpful because in the back, it's got a reading program. Because kind of like what we saw with uh, the family there, you, you kind of wanted to wonder, okay, where do I start? What do I do? How does it all fit together? A Bible reading plan. <laughs> I actually have links on this. Uh, the sheet that I just handed out to you, I'm also going to post online on um, both Facebook and the webpage, uh, which makes it a little bit easier to hit the hyperlinks for some of those connections. But I'll have it up as a PDF. But a good study Bible is going to have a reading plan. In this case, the Lutheran study Bible gives you three different choices. The challenge, the survey, and the sampler. 
So you can go, you can read it all the way through. You can do the challenge plan, which is most of the Bible. You can do a survey, which touches on specific important stories and themes. And then a sampler to kind of give you just a little taste. What's all in there? And there's lots of different places you can go to have different types of Bible reading plans. But when you have one like this, start with the easiest first. What I've always taught church leaders, and it applies to Bible study as well, um, celebrate small victories. I, I have a question. Yes. And what the Bible and what the 48, 49, when, what was the year that, that, that it actually happened? When did the 40s, 49 start? What, what was the actual year that it happened? Um, the, which, which 40 are you talking about? The beginning of the 40 days, like, like, like beginning of Lent. Oh, what we're doing right, the 40 days of Lent. Um, I've, I've always been curious. <laughs> began on Ash Wednesday, and it's tied into the lunar cycle. Oh. So that's why Easter and Passover always fall, always fall um, very closely together is, um, interestingly enough, the Western Church celebrates Easter a week earlier than the Eastern Orthodox Church mm. because we disagree on the lunar calendar. But it's 40 days from Ash Wednesday to Easter Sunday. But there's more than 40 days from Ash Wednesday to Easter Sunday because we don't count the Sundays as part of Lent. Technically, the church always looks at a Sunday as a celebration of Easter. It is always a festival. So even though we're celebrating Lent as a time of penitence and so forth, we don't, we should technically do that on the Sundays. Mm -hmm. Sunday's always the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And what was the, uh, what year was, was the actual, uh, um, the Last Supper for Jesus? Best guess is about 33 AD. Oh, okay. So, the mo most Bible scholars will say Jesus began his ministry when he turned 30. So, around year 30, ministry lasted three years, crucifixion, resurrection, year 33. Some will, and some will say you might want to add another three years. So somewhere between 30 to 36 AD was the three-year span of his ministry. Oh. And that's what gets recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke um, in, in those. But again, going back to some of those promises, if you don't understand Abraham, and if you, then you need to go to the next covenant that God makes with someone, which is King David and why God makes promises to, and when, you, and when you read the story of King David, it is like, it is an R-rated soap opera. Um, God makes a covenant with David that one of his descendants will always rule over the people of God, will always be king. That ties into Jesus too. Those covenants, God does different ways in which he tries to set the world right and draw his people in creation back to him in love. And finally, in the person of Jesus, God says, all right, I'm going to handle this myself. And God takes human form in the person of Jesus. And the Bible just takes you to that point. But again, it gets, it's, this is a long book. This is like some of the science fiction and fantasy novels I read. <laughs> so it, it takes some time, it takes some discipline, and, and so today in talking about reading the Bible, the first thing to start with is just to pick it up. My suggestion is with a reading plan and just start reading little bits at a time. Um, Sometimes folks ask me, if I'm, I, I want to read one book of the Bible from beginning to end. Which one should I do? I usually tell them Matthew. You've got four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
I never ever, even though you have the people at the football games holding up John 3.16, don't ever start with, with John. The, John has too much going on. Matthew is really good in that Matthew's gospel was, it's attributed to Matthew the disciple, the tax collector. But it's written to um, in a Jewish audience primarily, but they aren't all Jews. So Matthew takes the time to explain connections with the Old Testament. Luke does a pretty good job of that, too. But Luke's a little longer. Matthew is more my vibe. So, and, but Matthew starts with the birth of Jesus, but it's not the Christmas story. It's the arrival of the wise men after Jesus is born. Because the Christmas story that we hear on a Charlie Brown Christmas, come, read from the King James Bible, is actually Luke's account, which has the shepherds in the field, but no wise men. The wise men have the star, the shepherds have angels. And they don't show up at the same time. The shepherds show up the night Jesus is born, the wise men show up about a year later. differences in the stories. But each author is writing to a particular audience to convey a particular meaning. It's not that one is telling the truth and the other one has it wrong. They're writing history in a way that's different than what we know. They emphasize different things. So for Matthew's Gospel, Matthew being a Jewish writer, how does one become a blessing to the nations? Again, that was that promise of Abraham. Jesus is born. Who shows up bringing him gifts? Wise men from the nations. So, Bible studies, and you can go online, I've got recommendations too. If you want to get into a book, we can do Bible studies here, verse by verse. They're always fun. And you can always find online or book resources where you can sit down and go through a book verse by verse. And there are these marvelous little things called commentaries that pastor people dearly love because it takes it apart and often have really good ideas for sermons. Um, but it goes into the language and says, okay, you need to remember this, or this is what's being talked about. This is referring back to something. Said, ah, I had no idea. I never knew but just take a start. The other thing I also tell folks when, when I do a class like this is when you buy a Bible, get a pen and a notebook. And don't be afraid to write in your Bible. If you have Muslim friends, they'll be horrified that you write in your Bible if they haven't had many Christian friends because you would never do that in the Quran. Christians, however, have always written in their Bibles. And so we've got study notes and questions, you know, highlighters. You have a favorite verse. Have a, have a notepad where you can write things down, scribble in the margin. I really don't get this. Um, read this at my funeral. I can't tell you how many times I've had people, um, you know, kids, when they asked me, yeah, we went, we're planning mom or dad's funeral, what should we do? I said, find the Bible. You will find things in there, and I found that to be true, particularly for, for previous generations. Um, cards and little pieces of paper, or just scribbles and margins of things that resonated with their faith that was important to them. It's okay. And when you wear out a Bible and it starts falling apart and that happens, the respectful way we do that is we burn them, rather than just simply throwing them in the trash. But to get to a point where you wear out a Bible, I think that's something that would make God smile.